Welcome to episode two of The Sword Sessions, where I talk with experts who aren't me, and I welcome them onto, onto my channel, and we partake of their knowledge and experience. And today we're going to be um, watching a interview and discussion I had with Augusto, who is the armourer who made the armour for Todd of Todd's Workshop and Todd Cutler, um, his uh, latest round of arrows versus armour testing. Augusto is also a friend of mine, and you can find him on uh, videos that I've done in the past, for example, at the Wallace Collection with Toby Capwell. So um, I hope you enjoy this, and um, you might have to turn the sound up a little bit because I used a different method of recording for it, but I hope that the information contained herein is useful to you in your studies. Enjoy. Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator. Now I've got a very special guest with me today, a guest who's been on the channel previously, but several years ago now, uh, I think before lockdown, wasn't it? Before uh, the pandemic. But uh, in the previous world, we, today we're going to be looking at the uh, incredibly complicated but also very interesting topic of how was medieval and Renaissance armour proofed what do i mean by proofed i mean tested how is it tested against weapons so um augusto here and I'll, I'll hand you over to him in a second to um, introduce himself um is involved with todd's project looking at testing armor and in fact he has one of the pieces of armor with him there um with joe gibbs shooting arrows at it so a lot of people want to know about arrows versus armor um but of course any weapons versus armor is, is a very um, pertinent topic to look at because armor obviously developed to resist various types of weapons. And a big part of those was arrows, longbow arrows, but also crossbow bolts as well. And then later on, guns. Um, so the question we're going to address here is how was medieval and Renaissance armor tested or proofed? And that gives us the word um, bulletproof in later centuries, of course. So, Augusto, um, you're currently um, working on, well, you've made uh, a bassinet, uh, which you can show us in a second, um, that's going to be tested with arrows. Um, and also, why don't you introduce, as well as telling us about that, uh, just generally what you do and who you are? Sure. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Augusto Boerbrandt. I'm from Italy, but I've been living in Sweden since 2013, where I studied university for five years. And after that, I opened my uh, company making and selling custom made armor. So that's what I've been doing since uh, 2018, 2019. Uh, so currently, I'm like uh, Matt said, I'm involved into the arrow versus armor part two, which will involve shooting uh, 160 pound um, arrows at a reproduction of the Wallace A69 bassinet. We will be mostly looking at going through the vision slits and the side of the bassinet because that's what one of the sources talks about that the French knight were worried about and then we have this uh, lovely avental of handmade rings made by Isaac Krull, uh, another colleague from Sweden which also makes plate armor but mostly specializes in mail and among his various incredibly good products he makes handmade mail so we, he reproduced uh, an avental mostly based on Kerberg 15 um, avental uh, so the weight is the same the, the ring thickness is mostly the same and uh, the ring uh, internal diameter is the same as well. So we've been trying to go as close as possible to the originals, and then we will shoot at them with uh, a few arrows. A few will explode. A few probably will go through, but maybe not enough. Maybe enough to incapacitate the warrior wearing the helmet, but uh, we have no idea. We will see. That that is what is, remains to be seen, doesn't it? So um, so I'll obviously put the links below to um, your. Uh, social media presences and everything else and for those of you who don't know um, a lot of the groups on Facebook for example over the years Augusto has been very active on and is a real um, is very particular with the shapes <laughs> with the shapes of bassinets and is very keen to uh, criticize replicas that don't look right and so he's very about trying to get as close to the originals as possible and therefore that makes him very much I think one of the right people to be to be working with Todd on this project um, and of course we're very lucky to have him uh, with us today so check out those links below so as an overall view here, um, we're specifically looking in this video at sources 
for testing of armor. Okay, now when we come to this topic and look at medieval weapons versus medieval armor, we have experimentation like Todd is doing. That's one way of approaching it. Another way of approaching it might be archaeology. So looking at surviving armor, which has damage to it from weapons, which could be testing or it could be battlefield uh, situations obviously those are different uh, things um, but what we're specifically looking at here is the source material um, now the types of source material I had a little bit of a chat with uh, Augusto and obviously this has been something we've been talking about in the run-up to filming this and essentially we think that um, the types of source that we're looking at break down into three types there's descriptive accounts of testing there are regulations for standards, for example, that a guild or um, a uh, sort of even a royal authority might decree for the testing of armor that it has to meet certain standards. And then finally, there's art. Sometimes in uh, pictures from the period, we see armor being tested. Um, so um, I'm going to more or less hand over to um, Augusto to go through some of the data that we have to draw upon for how was medieval armor tested? What was it tested against? What was it expected to resist or not resist, as the case may be? Um, and of course, bear in mind that there is a spectrum. So what you'll see in these sources is it's not that all armor was expected to achieve the same goal. Some armors were designed for one purpose, might be jousting, might be war, might be, uh, you know, a, a club tournament, whatever. So the, different armors made for different purposes. But equally, even if it was just war we were looking at, different armors are expected to maybe protect you better or less against different things based on their value their weight uh, what type of soldiers are wearing them and that type of thing um before Ag augusta goes into it i want to just mention the, the descriptive so i mentioned descriptive regulations and then pictures art um, and in the descriptive accounts i have one which i came across years ago i didn't dig out the exact text unfortunately in time for this but it comes from the coroner's rolls um, 14th century from london and it describes a flemish merchant who was boasting about the quality of his acatons and that his acatons could resist a stab from a dagger. Now, obviously, there's lots of interpretation involved there. What exactly is an acaton? Uh, is that has that word been translated or understood correctly? And things like that. And in boasting of how strong his acatons were, he pulled out his dagger to demonstrate it and stabbed himself and died. So in that case, the Akaton didn't resist a dagger stab, but nevertheless, there's an example there, sort of anecdotal example of how sometimes people might um, demonstrate the strength of their wares um, uh, in a casual, unofficial way, which if he hadn't died, never would have been recorded. So sometimes we have these incidental, you know, um, anecdotal accounts, just descriptive accounts of armor being tested or, or and failing in this case. Right. So over to Augusto, let's have a little look at the, what sources have we got to draw upon if we want to find out how was armor in the medieval period tested or proofed? Um, so... Most of the sources that we're going to talk about today uh, come from this book, uh, The Armorer and His Craft by Charles Fuchs. And it is was first, first published in 1912. So it is a bit dated, but it is loaded with uh, mostly actually original accounts and uh, sources, bits here and there. And then towards the end of the book, there's holes, letters, sections or uh, ordinances that we're going to talk about uh, later. Uh, so it is really, really good for what it is. And some of the injectures and conclusions that he arrives to are maybe a bit dated by today's standards, but by the time this one has been like a godsend for armor enthusiasts. So I really recommend, I suppose this is an out of print book, so just find it on eBay or Amazon or something. But it's not, I mean, it was 20 bucks for me, so it wasn't that hard. Uh, but um, if you go into the testing of armor, um, uh, the common theme for at least medieval, so we're talking uh, 14th and 15th century mostly, we can talk about later uh, firearms um, uh, in a second moment, but most of the stuff that is armor is being tested with seems to be crossbows and bows. Um, the terminology, of course, there's a variety of sources and uh, I unfortunately do not have any German sources at hand or at the German land speaking. 
uh, sources. So I mostly have to rely on uh, French and Italian and Latin, which is what I can understand at the first uh, read without uh, translation. And uh, it seems to be that the common theme is that the armors were supposed to withstand uh, crossbows and bows, but of, in a various degree, and we can go into the details later. But um, can I already? Yes? Can I? So I just jump in there. So I think that was an interesting, um, an interesting point that when you look at these, whether it's the regulations or descriptive accounts, um, the testing against missile weapons often seems to override testing against you know lances or swords or whatever not to say that they yes. didn't test them against hand weapons as well but there are several things we could take away from that i think uh, and this is all theory and, and we don't know for certain but that could imply that those are the toughest things that are going to hit them the things which are most likely to compromise them or it could be because you're likely to be hit multiple times indiscriminately on your armor by those Precisely. things because if you're in hand-to-hand -hand combat, someone with a sword is not going to be repeatedly jamming a sword into your breastplate because it won't do anything. They're going to be trying to stab at your armpit or in your face or whatever, or throw you on the ground. Um, so I think there's various different... I, I think it's an interesting topic by itself. It probably deserve its own video. So we won't go into great depth, but it is, I think for the viewers, it's an interesting thing to consider that these tests are very often, perhaps even normally against missile weapons, even in gunpowder age, of course, gunpowder weapons being more hitting with more force against armor for a range of reasons. Also, another thing that I just thought about is that against hand weapons, you can actively defend yourself. You have a yeah. shield, you have your own weapon you can defend with, even if it's a, uh, uh, knight versus knight um, situation, you can parry with your lance, the opponent's lance, so then uh, perhaps uh, the armor it was, uh, in this case, the testing was mostly based on like passive protection, if we can call it mm -hmm. that, where mm -hmm. like you might not be able to um, cover a certain flank. Maybe you have a shield on your uh, left side, but on the right side, there's people still shooting at you, or like it's in a siege situation where you're not in uh, able to uh, actively, I mean, you can pair yourself with your arms and cover yourself, yeah, but then you might have somebody in a different angle shooting at you rather than fighting you in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And if that's the case, then you can defend yourself actively. So mm. I think the emphasis on the uh, ranged weapon is also because that's the most hard, um, it's also the most common weapon that you will have to that you won't be able to uh, actively deflect. So that I, the armor will have to withstand whatever comes at you in a passive way. Yeah. I mean, I think also in, in modern tests, and again, this is something for, for uh, Todd and his calculator to, to look at maybe, but the observation that I've seen over the years is that things like arrows and crossbow bolts have a, a, a greater chance of getting through armor than hand a normal hand weapon would um that being said i did put the point of a pole axe through a, a brigandine um perhaps to a similar level to an arrow might have done but anyway i think the arrow uh when todd's test the arrows penetrated more easily through the that same type of brigandine than i was able to do with a rather heavy pole axe um so i think for the most part and they're definitely true in gunpowder age and definitely true with the most powerful crossbows windless crossbows they're probably the most powerful things that are going to hit armor as well. Even though couched lances, but now we're talking like second half 14th century and 15th mm. century. So we're talking like a knight with an arete de cuirasse. So that is like the little hook that sticks out and the lance of this graper, which is this ring and the combination of being on horse and having a three kilo weapon, which is four meters long and then coming at 40 kilometers per hour and charging through, probably that would either at least equal the most um so my crossbow but but hmm. we, we don't have the numbers yet but so my so my understanding what i've seen yeah my, my understanding pretty, from, they pack a punch yeah my understanding from firearms versus armor is that velocity is the most important factor and so a lance whilst it hits with a lot of momentum because of the mass um it's not traveling at a very high speed, whereas um, breaking through plate, whether it's a modern firearm um, into tank or, you know, in even tank tank rounds, a lot of it's about velocity rather than necessarily the mass of the projectile. But it's anyway, balance. <laughs> yeah. like we don't we don't have that much numbers yet. We have much more about ballistics rather than hand to hand. And this old yeah. stuff that we need to see. But going back to the sources. Yes. <laughs> um, the first um, 
are descriptive as in adjectives that the armor has. So uh, of course, male is the first that comes because we have been having male armor for hundreds of years because before we get common plates, plate armor in Europe in the Middle Ages. So then the armor is described as like half proof of full or full proof. Um, so there was already a distinction and this is like the early 14th century. Uh, where uh, armor was already being divided in being half proof or full proof or not proof at all, even though the omission might be for some other reason. So they were, there seemed to have been already a um, system to test uh, certain uh, protections. And uh, so they were already thinking in the logic of a workshop making a product and then I guess sampling something or having a yearly check or a guild regulation or something where they would have to um, um, they would have to prove that the armor was capable of uh, withstanding certain weapons or not. In the beginning, they're quite um, uh, vague about it. They just say uh, proof or not. Or in Italian, they have tutta botta or mezza botta, which is like full blow or half blow. Uh, oh. So it is again vague in later sources is more specific and we can talk about those but it seems to be that of course first of all male gets divided into different categories and that could also have to do with ring thickness ring density uh material tempered steel not hardened steel because armor let's remember that also was sometimes made of tempered steel so that would be a pretty tough nut to crack and then this uh throughout the 14th century it starts to apply to uh plate armor as well. Uh, Datini, which is a merchant from the uh, 14th century Italy, second half, he also starts talking about like from 1465, 1467 about bassinets, which are full proof or half proof. Uh, so that also becomes to being applied to plate armor as well. And then mm. not interestingly enough, but maybe not surprisingly enough, it is helmets first because you're nogging, that's kind of what uh, you need uh, have uh, invulnerable at least at, at first in a battlefield uh, mm. situation. So we have um, those descriptions of the item themselves, while for the actual testing itself, we have to go into the 15th century, okay. at least source wise. Yeah. So so the, the evidence is there that we're doing the testing, but we just don't yes. have any we don't have any surviving details of it. Yes. I yeah. wonder. So half proof or full proof? I wonder how that was defined. I'd, so yeah. Luckily, we have the uh, 1448 uh, armorer um, regulations from the French city of Anvers, I suppose that's how we pronounce it, where uh, curious makers and brigandine makers are required to test, to have their armor tested, or at least it's supposed to be foolproof when it's against a crossbow, a windless crossbow, or a Kranekin crossbow, and that's a foolproof cuirass or brigandine. And then when it's half proof, it's a, a hand or hook span crossbow or an archer's pull. Okay. And that is a half proof. And it's interesting that they do they make equivalent of the archers and the crossbowmen with a with a hook crossbow. So they kind of makes is a bit telling of what was Ex the uh, expected performance of both of those weapons and they were like categorized as like lower danger compared to uh, higher yeah. danger which is like a 1200 1600 pound crossbow so this is this is an interesting source on a number of levels um and these are so it's brigandines isn't it that's primarily brigandines and cuirasses yeah. they're okay. they really interesting because they also specify the weight that you should have Mm -hmm. And then the weight of the cuirasses and the foolproof brigandines is exactly what we see in museums as well. Right. It yeah. is really interesting because they get the exact weight. And then we have a few extant examples, which are three millimeter thick in the middle and have placard and brass plate on, and they weight exactly that. It's 13, 15 kilos of cuirass, which is supposed to be foolproof. Yeah, so I mean, you know, I, the headline there is there is there's different levels of armor depending on how much weight you wanted to carry and how much money oh, yeah. you wanted to spend. Uh, so if you wanted to make yourself proof against the most powerful missile weapons of the day, pre gunpowder, then you potentially could but it, as always it comes at a cost it comes at the cost of weight expense uh, mobility that kind of stuff. Um, 
and but I think it was also for me it was a big eye opener when I first I think I was first became aware of this source about a year or so ago and um it was eye opening to me that there were brigandines being made which were proof against these weapons because a lot of people have the perception as I think from a kind of video game or role playing game perspective that a cuirass is is much more hardcore than a brigandine is and a brigandine is the sort of thing that a more lowly soldier might wear but the fact is you know as you know uh brigandines were worn by kings and and all sorts they, they they've got they offer different advantages to a cuirass yes. um but some brigandines were incredibly tough and incredibly oh, yes. hardcore if they were made to the right you know to that to oh, those yeah. standards you just need to make the place thick enough and or, then or the hard. Brigandines yeah are... Yeah, yeah, or, or hard, hard yeah, enough, or, yeah. or both at the same yeah. time. So, as if you have fifteen kilos of steel on your torso, it doesn't really matter that much if it's a solid plate against multiple plates. Of course, solid plate is one single shell, and the multiple plates can pop off, but mm. they can pop off, and mm. the plate like blowing out is still energy that is not going in your chest. So the armor but worked. Yeah, and conversely, what it tells us is there was there were brigandines and perhaps cuirasses at the other end of the spectrum. Oh yeah, that, that didn't that didn't resist oh, these things yeah. because you wouldn't bother proof it, you know, announcing that oh this this brigandine is proof against a windless crossbow or or even a Kranakin crossbow if they all were because if they all were, you wouldn't need to have the proof in the first place. You, exactly. you know, everyone would know that. So so oh, it yes. kind of tells us that you know at the lowest level there might have been some some armor which has quite thin plates of iron uh, and then at the other end of the scale there's some which have got quite thick plates of hardened steel and then there's yes. everything in between um Correct. and also you know you you've you pointed out to me a number of times because i know that in my videos i've been guilty of always suggesting that something that's made of steel is is hardened or something that's mm. made of carbon steel is hardened but i mean there is evidence that or in fact there's examples in museums of armor which is made of carbon steel but isn't hardened uh, yep. or in some cases there's evidence they tried to harden it and it didn't work for some reason Absolutely. Um, so so there's every there's a big spectrum and there's every kind of prime every example there is, there there. is. Yeah. Um, the other thing as well, a lot of people, I think, uh, let's not go off onto the topic too much of bows and crossbows in this video, but obviously this does relate partly to uh, Todd's experience as well, so it may be of interest to some people here. It's an interesting point you make about the fact that the handheld bow is equated to the um, hand spanned bow or that the, what would usually be using a goat's foot lever or a belt hook. Um, so, so in other words, without a mechanical you know like without a winding device yes um and it's obvious i think to most people that a windless crossbow is the most well we know is the most powerful type of crossbow kranikin is sort of down from that and then goat's foot lever and a belt hook are kind of lower down from mm -hmm. that but they still require you know if you've got a belt hook you're still using the strength of both your thighs and back oh, yeah. when when you cock the thing so it's still pretty powerful now it's interesting a lot of people might use that as evidence to say therefore that okay so bows are only the same power as um the goat's foot um lever or the the belt hook type of crossbow and that does seem to be evidence of that conversely we have to remember this is a french source and the french weren't famous for their archers <laughs> so I mean, a lot they had a Frank uh, archer uh, they tried to copy the english so the, they knew what they were against the burgundians in particular did as yeah, well yes but, yeah but i so uh, just to just because i know that there are a lot of warbow archers that watch my channel so just to fly the flag fly the saint george flag for a second it's possible of course that the, the, obviously there's a spectrum within hand drawn bows mm. and I think there's a fair amount of evidence from the sources to say that the English war bows or long bows were at probably at the pretty much the top end spectrum, top end of the spectrum in Europe at that time, probably for the average, uh, for the average, you know, because it was a legal requirement to practice archery in England and there was a, a culture of it. So, um, so anyway, let's, that's for another video, but I think it's uh, just, uh, I think it's worth mentioning that. Yeah, because it is interesting that it is, a source so then people we could the people can discuss from it but we do have like written down that they are equivalent at least in that context so and the year one point and the year for this is uh, i mean if we put this into a historical context as well it's 1448 is it or yes that seems to be the, the year so 1448 is also interesting because it's only six years before uh the end of the hundred years war mm -hmm. so 
the fact that at this time the French were paying a lot of attention to how strong their brigandines and cuirasses were at a time when the majority of English armies consisted of longbowmen is, I think, worth mentioning. And it's also worth mentioning that French armies at this time were increasingly using gunpowder, both handgunners and mm-hmm. um, ar- artillery, um, yeah. which, of course, at this point, the English didn't really have an answer to. And this was one of the reasons that the French won the Hundred Years' War, um, t- together with their organisation and the, the failing organisation of the English yeah. military. But... Um, yeah, it's a very interesting time historically, and it's, it's. I think it's very interesting that there's this stipulation on the strength and resistiveness of armor at this time, because it yeah. was it was a period of quite a lot of uh, conflict. I mean, not just between France and England, but also across other parts of Europe as well. So, an armor I think was probably. Uh, in the middle of the 15th century, I think uh, I'd be interested to know your view on this. I think it was probably being tested at about its limits in the in the mid to late 15th century. Yeah, I mean, you would again, you, the most powerful thing you can throw it at is like maybe a 1600 compound horn and sinew and wood windlass crossbow and a couch lance. That's and then and then. The next thing would be a cannon, but good luck hitting yeah, somebody, yeah. <laughs> in one person in armor with a cannon. Like you need 50 cannons to hit maybe two people in a volley. I mean, it, it's really hard to aim cannons at moving infantry. Or but, cavalry. Uh, uh, and also, cannon. and also, you know, like you, you can't you can't make armor that's that's um that's gunproof up to a certain beyond a certain caliber. No, right? precisely. I mean, you can so make, you can make pistol proof, but yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so at some point, you just kind of go, well, if that stuff hits you, you're dead anyway. Um, yeah. But, 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 but when all but when all of the arrows and crossbow bolts are hitting you, whether it's from the Ottoman Turks, of course, who are on the horizon and invading, uh, taking Constantinople only five years after this source, yeah. or whether it's English archers, or uh, whether it's um, Hussite crossbowmen or whoever you know it, there were a lot of missiles being shot at a lot of armor at this time so yeah. cool okay so um so that is a great source uh, are there any other things that we should uh, know about that source or, or take away from is that mentioned in charles fuchs's book that yes that yes it oh, is okay. both mentioned uh, in passing and then the whole regulation is at the end of the book so then you can read the whole and uh, i think they talk about price and and then about the weight that they should have and then again interesting that it does correspond basically 100 percent to the extant originals which is Mm. a good like proof that sometimes the medieval authors they knew what they were writing about yeah absolutely cool so what other sources have we got uh we have uh for example you were uh citing the um uh, the images Mm. that we do have pictorial evidence for uh, armor being tested and there are it is from a german belly fortis from like in the 1440s and yeah. they are shooting uh crossbows i think that it is uh hook span crossbows and they're shooting at an what seems to be an arming doublet or what you would call an akaton supposedly and then a hauberk they are hanging just on a stick and they're shooting at them and then there's two more images of them shooting at a guy in armor and there's the, the crossbow bolts are ba- bouncing around which is dangerous but maybe they had a bit of fun in that too probably yeah and we've also got an image of um someone stabbing a male shirt haven't we yes i I believe that's yet another german miniature from probably the 40s or the 50s of the uh, 15th century where somebody's just stabbing i think it's a male collar uh on a table and it's just more proof that they they wanted to make sure uh that their product would be uh, good enough and especially in germany with very tight um guild regulations and the fact that guilds were so powerful and omnipresent in everything and hyper regulating everything uh, especially also like in the armor trades because it's an important uh, industry because it was an industry and it just goes to show that um they had i mean like a pretty modern mentality on uh what the product should deliver Mm. Uh, and how it should behave on a battlefield. And there's later on, there's just written accounts. And this, I think, is a 16th and 17th century, where it is a very vague and very like uh, very convenient for the author to say, "Oh yeah, and the armor should be proof against every weapon that it should withstand," which is like saying everything but nothing at the same time. But still, that 
this was still going on in uh, later centuries where now it is instead of crossbows and, and arrows, it is uh, gunpowder. Yeah. So something else that I think is um, interesting as well, and, and again, worth noting, is that these tests are, as far as I've seen, are pretty much always against uh, a body, a torso defense, so brigandine or cuirass or a helmet. I have never seen any testing of arms and legs. Um, and I think that that might be because they wouldn't pass the tests necessarily and i remember when <laughs> i mean obviously some would but but overall yes, i mean it is fair to say that you know uh you know breastplates brigandines helmets are the most resistant bits of armor aren't they maybe sometimes mm -hmm. with if you include pauldrons but um you know arms and legs by necessity tend to be made of thinner plates don't they they are. I mean, if we take just the average of, I mean, my expertise lately uh, has been developing into 15th century Italian armor and limb armor for like the, the van brace and the rear brace, they seem to be between 1.2 millimeters and 0 0.8. Yeah. 0 0.8 millimeters, even if it's hard and carbon steel, you went through it with the pole axe and Todd went through it like butter yeah. with this lockdown longbow. Yeah. Uh, so, but I mean, but the difference is that the, the, the radiuses are much tighter because it's so you have much more skid. It's really hard to get it at yeah. a 90 degree angle. And it's much, and you're moving your arms constantly and your arm moves when it gets hit. Yeah. So it and it's just, just a smaller enough. target. Yeah. Yes. And it's a smaller, smaller thing to target. hit. But it's, it's, Absolutely. it's interesting. I, I, I can't remember which I, one of the Dukes of Burgundy, I, I can't remember which which one um, is recorded of have, have him being shot through the cuisse um, yeah. of his arm. Of a crossbow so, ball through the cuisse, yes. Yeah. So um, I, I think, again, I think it's whenever I see these discussions about arrows versus armor or anything like this, I, I always find it a bit frustrating. It's always a, a helmet or a breastplate that's being tested. And then mm. people are like, oh, well, you know, so arrows at Agincourt or wherever were useless. And I'm always like, yeah, well, first of all, there's gaps. Secondly, not everybody's wearing that level of armor and not all the armors of the top quality. But importantly, the limb armor is far less hardcore than the torso and the head armor um but what about the missiles being used for testing the armor do we know anything about yes. those yes we do we have uh, a late 14th century and early 15th century mentions of uh people procuring the crossbow bolts for testing armor specifically and they are meant to be <clears throat> of hardened steel and they cost twice as much as regular crossbow bolts wow. which does yeah. imply that they wanted to make sure that whatever they were testing was standing up to the top quality missile that would um go against them which so also goes to show that not all the missiles were like hardened steel tips as well yeah, absolutely. And so is where where and when is this source? Um from? this is from um uh, uh 1419 and it is from uh, orleans oh so it's french okay yes interesting and with that date as well that's that's of course the period when henry v is in the process of conquering france yeah um, and there is a similar one from i think 1411 from italy from the gonzagas so very close uh in time yeah it, very interesting and and also it relates to what the many records several records we have about henry v uh producing arrowheads for the ashen mm -hmm. campaign and requiring that they be made of hardened steel mm -hmm. um so maybe that wasn't normal european wide and then in mm -hmm. france around this time they're suddenly finding they're being hit by hardened steel heads and uh wanting to make sure their armor will protect them from it and of course, yeah. you know, people always want to talk about Agincourt, which they fixate on this one battle, which is a bit tiresome. Why not talk about Vernoy or one of the other yes, battles? Yes, we should that, talk know. about Vernoy. Uh, yeah, <laughs> which in a way is, is even more even more incredible than Agincourt. Oh, uh, yes, it is. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's it's uh, we always get into in, into these questions of, OK, why was this? How did this um, happen the way it did? How did it pan out both Agincourt and Vernoy? But and Vernoy was known as the second Asian court uh, by many. But uh, again, one of the things I always try to point out to people who think that the uh, longbow was the medieval machine gun, which I hate that expression, um, was, of course, look at the huge numbers of prisoners taken and the huge numbers of people 
who, you know, from the French side, who were uh, advanced into and came into contact with the English lines, apparently not being killed or necessarily even injured by the English arrows. Those in the best armour, Marshal Busico, for example, who died years later in prison, he wasn't shot to pieces with his arrows. Yeah, I think the missiles are a part of this equation as well. So good. I think that has been a good introduction to the topic. Um, any viewers to this will probably notice we don't have a huge number of sources. And so we're very lucky to have the sources we do have because they give us infinitely more information than we would have had if we didn't just have those one or two or three sources and this is often the way of medieval history we're often relying on a very small data set and trying to make big conclusions from only a little bit of information but um i think the thing that you should take away from this and i'd be interested if um augusto has uh, agrees with this is that by and large if you wanted to buy arrow proof crossbow proof armor you could but it came at a financial cost, potentially a cost of weight as well. But it was available. And we know that, for example, the French used, um, you know, Italian knights with armoured horses and were basically arrow proof during the Hundred Years' War. So, um, uh, so, so it was available, but it wasn't necessarily common. And therefore, you had to have these regulations uh, to, to observe that it was arrow proof. All right. Yeah, um, I, I don't think really have much. At else to add because that is the main takeaway it was available it was you could import it if it wasn't done in the local major city you could just import it from germany from uh, flanders from italy or whatever yeah so the descriptive accounts for testing are somewhat limited and we have to work with uh, what we've got with it but this this uh, french one from Anvers, over uh, for the armorers regulation yeah, yeah. yes yeah 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 um I think that's uh, definitely one of the, um, you know, it's one of those kind of Rosetta Stone moments of it's kind of like, okay, there's a there's a really detailed source describing how, how they did it. What we don't know, uh, I guess some people will be wondering, what, well, how did they actually do it then? And presumably they literally got the armor and they shot it. Um, and I wonder if this was done, if, if a brigandine was being made for a wealthy client, if they would actually demonstrate it in front of them and uh, kind of extrapolating from later periods this was done with swords um and I, I suspect you know we've got the bulletproof thing so i think it's worth just mentioning briefly the what bulletproof is so the expression bulletproof comes from testing of a breastplate uh, most people would say with a pistol, but I actually know of examples of it being done later on with a musket. Uh, so in the 19th century, French uh, cuirassier um, breastplates were tested with a musket. They were musket proof. Um, and traditionally, over the over the heart, where the heart was imagined to be, um, and leaving a dent there. Now, you, you, I'm sure know more about this than I do. My understanding is we know some examples of where that dent has been actually put in manually yes. yeah <laughs> there is a very good article i think from alan williams where he mm. does goes uh, does go exactly into that where yeah. not all armors with like bullet proofs are bulletproof like yeah. where the, the, they're fakes they're they're original the period originals but the, the dent has been hammered in and mm. hasn't actually been shot at which is very fascinating where they would go to the length of counterfeiting yeah uh, their armor yeah, and I mean, obviously, if we if we're existing in a world where people are paying huge amounts of premium money so mm -hmm. for their for their armor to be proofed to a certain level, and in yeah. in our period maybe a windless crossbow, but later on maybe a, a you know arquebus, then then clearly there's going to be some people are going to try and capitalize on that by faking it. Um, oh, yeah. so, but again, this is we, we, this is conjecture because we just, for the 15th century, 14th, 15th, uh, and even most of the 16th century, we just don't really know very much about um, how it was done, if it was done in front of the client, if people just trusted that, oh yeah, this is these are the these are the windless crossbow proof ones over here, or if you want to spend half as much, there's the uh, there's the Goatfoot's lever crossbow ones over there. Well, in the Unveil regulations, they do talk about if they are uh, foolproof, then they're supposed to have two marks. If they have if they're half proof, they're supposed to have only one mark, mm. uh, like one stamp. And for example, uh, Fuchs does confuse the 
shooting marks, uh, like the, the, the stamping on the armor from like being uh, arrow proof with armor's marks. So, yeah. so this thing where like you think that, oh, this, this Italian armor has three marks, it means that it's like good tempered steel and it's marked three times, but that has nothing to do with uh, right. uh, proofing, but it has to do with like workshop dynamics and subcontracting armors and different craftsmen. That, that that specific, at least in the Italian context, has nothing to do. Yeah. And probably also in the German, you could argue that in the German areas where a lot of the armor was stamped with um, uh, with the city mark, but then yeah. there would just uh, would be a general quality uh, reassurance rather than specific shooting at with this weapon or that weapon at this range. So yeah. in the very relation, these two marks are specific to the armor that are proof, but that has to be every case has to be analyzed individually because that doesn't mean that the, oh, every armor that has two marks in Europe in the museums is proof against crossbows. Yeah. Those brigandes and those cuirasses were, but the rest, we have to see what the sources say. And so obviously the subject of, of marks, stamps on arms and armor um, in this period is hugely complicated and can, as you say, it can relate to all sorts of different things. Um, it, you know, it can it can be just showing that it comes from a certain workshop. It could be something to do with, in this case, proofing. It talks about the marks. It could be something to do with importation, exportation, tax, all sorts of very, very complicated and trying to interpret them in the modern world is very difficult. But for anyone who doesn't know, if you look at something like the avant harness in glasgow it's covered in stamps isn't it um i it think is. and they're makers marks i think aren't yeah, they? they're all makers marks yeah. and we, the attributions are most of them are bogus because we don't have we do not have any written record i mean we do have them for three armorers but they are not those ones that are in the avant so they're they usually they try to uh, attribute them with the initials like it's a bi you think oh it's this b bicocca dude or like this bikiniola dude but most of the attributions in museums they're just like founded on the thin air they're like they're yeah. not because we do not have the document that show us a mark and it means this mm. mark belongs to this guy yeah. so it is like the avantar and it has its has i think it's like six different couples of marks so then the arms are different than the legs than the helmet and the cuirass so yeah it is a hodgepodge which was normal for armors of the time to be made by multiple workshops or mm. multiple craftsmen and then assembled into one yes people who were specialists in the different yes, bits yes. yeah um and so we're, we're not gonna i mean it would be st very easy to do a big video just talking about makers marks so that's a very yeah. interesting but in this case in terms of proofing and testing armor there's the implication there that in some places and at some times certain marks indicated that the web the um armor had been tested against certain weapons uh, yes. but, but we lost that we've lost the minutiae of the of the detail um for that um and equally you can assume that if that system was in place some people were probably fraudulently um abusing oh, yeah. it and putting fake marks on things you know we oh, have yes. we have a lot of them too yeah, we have uh, we've got records from from uh, London um, from the 14th, 15th century that state that helmets being imported are not allowed to have London armorers marks put on them, um, you know, because that would be suggesting they're of a certain quality when they might not. They might be unknown mm -hmm. quality. Yes. And equally, yeah. even leather like um, they, they, there's a complaint about imported armors having uh, leather of not good enough quality used on the oh, yeah. straps or something oh, yeah. so yeah it gets very very complicated but um but yeah so well i think we've covered a lot in this video augusta thank you so much for uh joining very me welcome. Thank and you for having um me. hopefully um we can have you again on soon for a, another armor related uh video on a slightly different topic um, any day yeah cool brilliant thank you and viewers uh, if there's specific things you'd like to know about armor let us know down below in the comments and if it's something we don't know off the top of our heads we can go away and research it and it might give us a whole new idea for something to uh, to research and uh, maybe do a video or maybe a paper about um in the future but anyway once again thanks augusto sorry for my pronunciation and it was um, good, it was good. <laughs> augusto there we go yes. <laughs> um thank you very much and we'll see you back on the channel really soon thanks everyone for joining us and um click the like button it makes a big difference to how well my videos do here and how many people get to see them and get recommended them and if you're not subscribed please consider doing so and i will see you back on the channel really soon and augusto hopefully will see you back on the channel soonish as well thanks folks
Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.